Howdy folks, this is Big Sam. Welcome back to Dragoon Week. We're focusing on a really cool variant of the Mosin Nagants, aka the Dragoon Rifle. Now, we've looked at a lot of interesting use cases of this rifle over the past week so far, and today's going to be no different. It's going to be a little bit different and not quite what you were expecting. Now, last time in particular, we were talking about the kind of rarity and why these guns are really great buys right now and they're undervalued in the market. Now, one of the things we touched on in that last video was the fact that, in my opinion, uh, about 70% of the Dragoons that I typically see come up for sale are Finnish, okay? Now, that's not to say that's the actual number of the market supply, but a best guess from, from what I've seen is around 70%. And we're not talking about a ton of rifles. Dragoon rifles, as we know, are not very common at all. But it seems that the majority of them I see are probably from Finland. And in the last video, I said about 70%. But what about the other 30%? of rifles okay well that's a really good question it seems to me that about mm, again this is just based off of my opinion and my experience about 25 percent ish so roughly a quarter to a third we could say of dragoon rifles in the current uh, circulating supply, at least here in the United States, are from not Finland, but rather Spain. Okay, why are they from Spain? What, what, what were Dragoon rifles doing in Spain? Another really good question. You're asking a lot of good questions, so I appreciate that. Well, in this video today, we're going to talk about why Mosin Nagants were in Spain and then came from Spain to America. That's a really interesting story. So, to start off with our story today, we're actually gonna uh, talk about a man by the name of Francisco Franco. Now, here in America, we always say Francisco Franco, but I think it's really Franco because he was Spanish. But anyway, um, Francisco Franco, as we call him here in America, was not really what you'd call a, uh, a nice person. He was a, um, what's the best term? He was basically a fascist, and he wasn't really happy with the current um, quote-unquote liberal government in, uh, in Spain at the time. This would have been in the 1930s, the mid-1930s, so before World War I. And uh, as a result, one of the things he did was uh, basically just started to uh, just go to more of the, more, the more rural, uh, right-leaning areas, as a lot of people would see them in Spain. There, there were more that would have been more ideologically interested in someone like him than, you know, the liberals in the city. And he actually basically got them to revolt and say, oh, no, we're going to do our own thing now. And eventually what it led to is a civil war in Spain between the uh, liberals, the leftists, also called the Republicans. There's a lot of terms that get thrown around here, so try not get confused too much. But the Republicans on the left and the fascists on the right, essentially, okay? The Republicans were the ones in power, the fascists were the ones that wanted to become in power. Uh, so he led a huge revolt, and this, this sparked a really horrible mess in Spain. One of the things that happened here was the fact that a bunch of the foreign powers, so the places like the United States, Great Britain, um, Italy, Germany, and the Soviet Union all signed a uh, basically a non-intervention pact. They all sort of agreed, okay, Spain's going to do their own thing. They're having some issues, but we don't want this to lead to a World War II, basically what could have happened. So no, nobody's going to intervene in this conflict. Hmm. Well, how did that go for them? 
Well, unfortunately, um, not that great. So this is where things get kind of interesting. See, Italy, um, Germany, and the Soviet Union sort of didn't really hold up to their agreement, okay? Let me give you an example. The Soviet Union said they signed the non-intervention pact, and they subsequently started sending tanks to Spain. Tanks. So, I mean, that's... Why did they even bother signing it? Well, obviously, that agreement wasn't worth the paper it was written on if the people that signed it aren't willing to abide by it. Oh, boy, is that relatable to today. Well, what's interesting is now what we see here is essentially a sort of proxy war in, the, in Spain in the 1930s where you have now these different entities and countries, uh, the communists in Russia supplying arms and ammunition into Spain to support the government there and the government's uh, supporters. And then you have places, the fascist countries like uh, Italy, Mussolini in, in Italy, and uh, Adolf Hitler in Germany tr uh, trying to help out the, uh, the fascist Francisco Franco. And uh, Germany would actually send like air raids into Spain. I mean, this got into a really major conflict. It was a really horrible, this was not like just some minor kerfuffle. This was a massive conflict with thousands and thousands and thousands of casualties. And it was a really horrible time to be alive if you were in Spain at that time. It was just not a good situation for anybody. Well, what's interesting here, though, is particularly with the uh, the the Republicans, the the guys who current who had control of the government, they were trying to keep control of the government from uh, Francisco Franco. They actually received support from a lot of foreigners, okay? I mean, anyone you could imagine, from Sweden to even the United States. And they basically ended up having a whole brigade of just uh, foreign, foreign fighters, if you will. Now, why are we talking about this, and how does this relate to Moses? Well, what's interesting here is... There is a ton the Spanish Civil War is a really interesting subject because there are tons of different arms getting supplied by all sorts of different countries into Spain. Okay, on both sides, on the left and the right, everyone was trying to get support from everyone they could. Now, specifically today, we're going to be focusing on the support given to the Republicans. Okay, so the left-leaning guys. Now, who is their primary supporter? Well, it, of course, since they were the more left-leaning people, their supporters were the communists, uh, specifically in the Soviet Union, who, of course, were Marxist. And their support was just a wide variety of really interesting firearms from really going all the way back to the 1800s. See, the Soviet Union had a ton of interesting old guns lying around, uh, things like the 1895 Winchester lever action rifle, the uh, the Vetterli Vitali rifle, which was actually an Italian gun. This gets weird. It was an Italian gun that was a black powder 10 millimeter gun that was then retrofitted in the 1880s with a four shot magazine. And then during World War One, Italy sent them as aid to Russia, who of course was on their side helping to fight the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and those things were still left around and ultimately would end up getting sent to Spain to help fight a country that was fighting against a party that was being supported by Italy. That makes perfect sense, right? Maybe. Maybe you're with me so far, maybe not. That's okay. This is a complicated conflict. There's a lot of weird stuff going on, folks. Okay, but we didn't have just those. We had a lot of old Mosin rifles as well. Of course, that's what we care about here on the channel. Now, what kind of Mosins would we see the USSR send to the Republican forces? Uh, well, that's a great question. Now, there's a few different types of rifles. Now, one of them are going to be... And this was sort of a, a more weird case. Um, they're actually newly produced rifles. A lot of the rifles sent to S Spain on both sides were not necessarily new rifles. 
uh, which kind of makes sense, right? It, uh, a lot of times you're, they weren't necessarily sending their best to these places if they wanted to help them. They're like, well, we can spare these old things we have laying around. Yeah, we're not using them. Let them use them. They actually, in the Soviet Union, in 1936 and 1937, the Tula and Ijevs factories actually produced a ton of 9130 rifles, and it seems that maybe just a little over 100,000 of these rifles were actually sent to Spain as aid to the Republican forces, okay? So the, not all, but the vast majority of Mosin-Nagant rifles that you'll see that have the years 1936 or 1937 on them were actually sent to Spain originally, right when they were new, okay? Really cool. But that's not the only rifle sent to Spain. We would see a lot of other interesting old Mosins. In particular, we'd actually see a lot of older style uh, M91 rifles. Now, some of them were like pre-World War I. Some of them were actually made after World War I. Because remember, they really made M91 rifles the long pattern up until the mid-1920s, even after World War I. So some of those rifles ended up going to Spain as well. Well, among all of these, we of course also had some Dragoon rifles. How about that? It's Dragoon week. We obviously have to go talk about Dragoons at some point, right? Well, that's this point. Now, it's sort of the same thing. You could see Dragoons potentially before World War I, uh, as far as we know. And also you could see Dragoons. This is probably more common is you would see Dragoons made after World War I, made into the uh, mid to late 1920s even. Because the Dragoon rifle, as we're going to talk about in a future episode here, they actually made them all the way up until around 1931. So they had a ton of Dragoons laying around, and at this time... So, a lot of those ended up going to Spain, amazingly. So now you're having this interesting scenario where you have this buildup of all these weird Mosin variants, both old and new. You've got new 9130 rifles, you've got the older M91 rifles, and you've got Dragoon rifles, okay? That's, that mostly covers the, the Mosins that were sent to Spain. But that's not all of the Mosins that were sent to Spain. You see, there was actually somebody else that sent Mosins to Spain as well. And of course, they were none other than the country of Mexico. All right, now at this point, you, you kind of have to ask yourself, well, how did Mexico get Mosins, one? And two, why were they sending them to Spain? Well, that's, that's an interesting question. Uh, now, the second one can be a little bit complicated, so maybe we won't get into that as much here. But as far as we can tell, Mexico had some um, American contract Mosins laying around from uh, Remington and perhaps New England Westinghouse as well. Those, as far as we can tell, were probably sold to Mexico some point in the 1920s. But again, this is going down a rabbit hole that we're going to have to cover another day because this topic really deserves more research and its own video because it's really strange. Uh, but Mexico had Mosins and they decided to send them to Spain. And the story goes that a lot of these were shipped to the foreign, these foreign legions in Spain and they were shipped in these crates where the rifles were wrapped in uh, Mexican newspapers. And apparently from that they got the nickname Mexicanskis. This was the nickname given for American M91 Mosin rifles set to Spain by Mexico in the Spanish Civil War. History can get really weird sometimes, folks, right? Okay, yeah, so there's a lot of weird Mosins. Now, among these are Dragoons, right? But what, another interesting thing I want to talk about here is, is actually some of the people that were using these. And one person in particular I want to talk about today is George Orwell. Now, this is a this is sort of a famous, um, I guess, what, what do you call him? A deep thinker, right? A uh, a writer, an author, a um, one one of those types of people. Probably someone who spends a lot more time thinking and is probably a lot smarter than I am about certain things. 
Um, now, George Orwell, you've probably heard of him, famous for making some books such as uh, Animal Farm and 1984, which, of course, is pretty relevant to our society even today still. But back in the day, of course, he was one of these uh, deep thinkers, and he, he had very strong opinions about ideas, and he was very much more on the left side, liberal side of the political spectrum. And, it, because, and he was one of those people that believed so strongly in these ideas, he was willing to help other people to fight for them. So he ended up actually going to Spain in one of these foreign legions to, to fight for the Republican leftist forces against the uh, Francisco Franco's uh, henchmen trying to take over the country, essentially. Uh, now, how did that go for him? Well, we'll get into that. But what's interesting here is in this picture right here, you'll see a guy holding a puppy. That is George Orwell. This is a really, this is a pretty famous picture because this is on the cover generally of his book. And I forget the name of it, uh, but it'll come to me. And um, if not, I'll have to put it up here on the screen so you can see it. But he, he wrote basically a, uh, an autobiography about his time fighting for uh, Spain in the Spanish Civil War. Pretty interesting book. I haven't read it uh, myself, but it's definitely one I'd like to read more into because I'm sure there's some really interesting information uh, about this conflict, and it should give some pretty good insights about how this was not really uh, a great place to be uh, Spain in the 1930s in this time. Okay, well, there's there's some interesting things about this picture, okay? Yes, he's holding a puppy, but right next to him, in fact, he's totally surrounded by Mosin Nagant M91 rifles. And you can see even there's one there in the picture that appears to have a Type 2 front barrel band, so that might even be a uh, American Mosin from Mexico. We don't really know. But there's a lot of Mosins in this picture with George Orwell. Now, this picture also gets even weirder because in the background, there is an interesting fella trying to hide by the name of Ernest Hemingway. Again, somebody you may have heard of before. Yes, Ernest Hemingway was also fighting alongside George Orwell with the uh, Republican forces there in Spain. Okay, now in particular, this is interesting, Orwell didn't fight with the, the normal... Um, international brigades, he actually specifically went to fight with a, a Marxist brigade. Um, and it's funny because he was basically a Marxist as far as I can tell, but um, he had some interesting experiences. There was some communist purges around 1937 in Spain. And he actually grew to strongly resent uh, the Stalinist regime and just Stalinism. And really what he claimed was he was really interested in, in uh, democratic socialism. So basically socialism with free and fair elections, as he put it. Which, I okay, it sounds nice, but let's actually see that work for a long period of time. Because I don't think it would. But again, he was one of these deep thinker guys. Really, really smart guy, but maybe not necessarily the most intelligent when it comes to something that would actually be a good idea in practice. Uh, in any case, sort of sounds like something Bernie Sanders would say, and, uh, well, I'll just leave that there. Um, but he, he, uh, he really grew to resent the communists, which I find kind of interesting, and ultimately he was actually injured. He was shot, uh, George Orwell was shot in the neck, uh, which has got to not be a super pleasant thing to happen. I'm assuming it was probably with a high-powered rifle, something like one of these. I would say no thank you. <laughs> um, now, apparently he was able to make a pretty good recovery, I guess. He was able to talk, I think, after that. But um, a lot of the people there told him he was very lucky that he was shot in the neck, and I guess that he survived. He said his response was, of course... Um, I think I would have been a lot more lucky if I didn't get shot at all. And, uh, well, that's kind of hard to disagree with, I guess. But it's really interesting in this time. You have all these weird things happening in Spain. And you have some really famous people fighting um, 
along, either using Mosins or alongside people using Mosins. In fact, here is a picture of Ernest Hemingway with an M91 rifle. Okay, so they, yeah, these guys were actually familiar with Mosins, among other things. And again, this makes sense because they're fighting um, with the Republican forces who are being supplied by the Soviet Union and Mexico, whom both uh, gave these guys Mosins, so not super surprising to see that. But we have a lot of Mosins here, so this is pretty cool. Now, what about Dragoon rifles? Well, <laughs> Dragoon rifles are not super common to see, especially in pictures during the Spanish Civil War, but I did manage to find one here that has some rifles in a teepee-like formation where the rifles are kind of leaning up against each other. It seems like there's one in the back here that it could be an M91, but I think because it seems to be about the same length as these 9130 rifles you see here, uh, and I think it seems like it has a uh, 9130 style handguard like this guy does. So that could probably be a Dragoon, uh, but that's about the best I could do. But we do know that Dragoons were imported from Spain. We know they were definitely used. How do we tell this, though? That's the question. Okay, well, remember... Um, on the Dragoon rifles we looked at so far, typically if they're from uh, Finland, Finland will have decided to put their own numbering here on the rear sight base, uh, because originally these guys were in Arshins, and Finland used uh, meters for sighting distance. So if your rifle doesn't have that, it's a good sign. Um, Sometimes these rifles, and this isn't just Dragoons, but this goes for a lot of Spanish Civil War rifles, will have somewhere, usually on the top of the receiver, but it could be in somewhere, uh, some other places, uh, stamped the words, Made in USSR. Sometimes it'll say, Made in URRS. That's a, probably just a typo. Um, seems like this had to do with, with uh, export laws at the time. But these rifles were stamped with this. And you won't even see that on just Mosins. I mean, you can even find uh, these old Vetterly rifles we were talking about earlier that are stamped made in USSR. Of course, meaning they were imported from Spain. Uh, and they, these, of course, were imported by uh, Interarms Co. around the 1950s, early 1960s, by the famous Sam Cummings, who, oh man, we need another video on Sam Cummings because that guy had a crazy life is basically an international arms dealer and well let's face it there aren't really many more cool jobs than being an international arms dealer and purveyor of mosins pretty cool right again a video for another day so if you see that that basically automatically means your rifle is from the spanish civil war i have heard some people i have heard some stories that Finland supplied Mosins to Spain in the Spanish Civil War. Uh, this is not the case. That did not happen. Finland, even if they were really interested in helping sway the outcome of the Spanish Civil War one way or another, the Spanish Civil War was only about three years away from the Soviet invasion of Finland, and Finland was mainly focused on that threat they were not really focused as much about what was going on because let's face it they couldn't really afford to they had to spend all their time and resources planning getting ready for potential soviet invasion which of course did come and they spent a large majority of the 1920s and 1930s trying to buy up every single mosin they could from europe they're not about to go start giving away massive amounts of Mosins to huh, Spain. So that that is basically just a wives' tale. So we that does help us really uh, give us a good distinction between Finnish Mosins and Spanish Civil War Mosins. There's really no uh, intersection there that we can tell. Okay, now let's say your rifle doesn't have the Finnish... Uh, markings on the rear sight and it doesn't have any sort of markings saying made in USSR. Well at that point how do we tell if it was Spanish or Finnish? Well 
probably should, I would, I would check on the barrel shank. You might see a D, a big D is in delta letter. That means it's finished. That's a stamping that means that, that means the throat was adjusted for the D166 cartridge. You should also check for the, the two letters SA in a box. That will mean that your rifle is finished as well. If it doesn't have that, then I would check things like the front sight and see if the front sight is, is, is taller uh, than it should be because Finland didn't have these rifles sighted for the Bayonetta fixed. So they had taller front sights on these rifles. Uh, I would also check to see if they cut an extra notch on in the rear sight base. And you can check out some of our previous videos because we took a little closer, more in-depth look at what that looks like. So if it doesn't have any of that, it's probably not finished, which of course almost certainly means it's from the Spanish Civil War, but not 100%. Because... My findings were about 70% of Mosins are from Finland, or Dragoons, excuse me. 25% of Mosins are from the Spanish Civil War, but what about the other 5%? Well, 5% is sort of a catch-all for some other just really weird stuff that we're going to have to talk about in our next episode. Is This guy we're going to revisit, because I actually don't think this guy is from the Spanish Civil War, and... He's not Finnish either. This is a very strange gun, and it's sort of inconclusive. And we're going to look more at this, and I think you guys are going to be excited about this. because It's really weird and interesting. But uh, what happened with the Spanish Civil War? Well, uh, ultimately, the Republican forces just couldn't hold on against the fascists. And so Francisco Franco, as we know, ended up taking over the country and Spain turned into a fascist country who kind of became allies with uh, Hitler because, of course, Hitler and Mussolini were fascists supporting him. You know, and, you know, in some aspects, uh, Francisco Franco was a kind of an aide and did, did was kind of helpful to um, Nazi Germany, but... Honestly, not nearly as much as the fewer would have appreciated. The fewer wanted, really wanted a lot of support from Spain for things like the Operation Barbarossa in the East, and he just didn't get the support he wanted from Spain. So uh, Spain kind of had their own ideas about what they wanted to do versus not wanted to do in, in regards to, you know, helping the Nazis out. But again, this is a story for another day. But the Republicans ended up losing, so all of their rifles got stockpiled uh, in the 1930s. And then they remained there until around the 1950s, when most of them were sent to, uh, uh, exported via uh, Interarms Co. and left the country. And a lot of them came here to the United States. So now we have a lot of really interesting Mosins, especially Dragoon rifles, courtesy of the Spanish Civil War. And while there weren't a ton of Dragoon rifles imported from Spain, there still are a decent amount in the collector's market um, in regards to, like, how many there are as a whole when we're talking about the supply of Dragoon rifles. Because remember, probably around a quarter to a third of the Mosins you're going to find are probably from the or Dragoons, excuse me, are from the Spanish Civil War. So while it's still not a lot, it's a significant number of how many Dragoons are still available. So th these guns, again, are not common, but man, do they have an interesting history, right? And up until now, we've mainly looked at Dragoons before and during World War uh, I. And so it's interesting to think about all the stuff they, and we looked at some of the use cases, right? It's interesting to think about all of the stuff or people they could have been used by. And then after all of that, to think they could have then been used in the Spanish Civil War, I mean, these guys have just an incredible history. One of the reasons they're really undervalued in the current market. So I hope y'all enjoyed this video talking about some interesting aspects of the Spanish Civil War. This was not a complete overview by any means, but again, this is a Mosin channel and <laughs> We're trying to focus on the Dragoon today, not necessarily the Spanish Civil War, so hopefully it wasn't information overload, and there's always room 
to do more focused videos on some of these topics in the future. But hopefully you got a kick out of this and you found it interesting. If you did, please consider subscribing. We do a lot of bows and got content like this. And uh, let me know if y'all got any prayer requests. All right, and then I'll tell you what. We'll see you next time.